Hello, I'm Beaver Felton for Super Chops for Bass, and welcome to Beginner Bass Part 1. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of fundamental topics having to do with playing bass, obviously, today, such as learn how to string the bass properly, learning how to tune the bass both by ear as well as by using a tuner. That's super important, and I'll demonstrate that shortly. Also, it's important to know how to play with a metronome, and I'll show you why and how uh, to do that in a, a short time. <laughs> Now we're also going to look at learning the anatomy or the parts of the bass. I'll just go over the different things so you see how they work and why they work and what to do with them. We're going to talk about uh, setting up tone on your guitar as well as your amp. Even though that's a subjective thing, I'm going to give you at least some good starting points for setting a getting a good sound. Okay, we're going to look at the notes on the neck. I'm going to give you a method by which you can learn all the notes on the neck if you just follow this method and invest a little bit of time each day into uh, doing that. Now. I'm also going to go into such things as rhythmic theory, time signatures, explain that, rhythmic values, note values, and phrasing like staccato or legato. And uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Now we're also going to look at uh, harmonic theory. In other words, I'm going to teach you major and minor scales, the fundamental building blocks of a lot of different music, including harmonies and chords, and et cetera, et cetera. Now we're going to look at proper left hand technique, positioning and angles. I like this, but like this and uh, also the right hand. And then we're going to look at technical development exercises. First the left hand, then the right, it's over here, and then coordinating the two together. And now also you're going to pick up a certain amount of ear training during a couple of these different things that uh, we're going to talk about today, such as, uh, well, there's several different things that'll kind of cross over and help you develop your musical ear without it being very painful. Now, we're also going to look at setting up a practice routine. And this is super important. I'll go into it later. And uh, the deal here is that it's not just that you practice, but how you practice and what you practice. So uh, that's something to really pay attention to. You're going to pick up a certain amount of terminology today during the course of the videos. You hear me refer to things in a musically literate way, which is important. Uh, let's see. More along the lines of neck visualization, if you will, you're going to start seeing and hearing the difference in the minor and the major, major intervals. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go through my equipment in just a minute, but first let me say that the last part of the video, which will probably be the most fun actually, is where everything else comes together. The proper technique, the feel, the time, you know, playing with a good sense of time, uh, playing with proper technique and fingering and phrasing properly, and you're going to have the opportunity to play in a group scenario so you don't have to, I'm sure your goal is not to sit at home and play with yourself because uh, if that's the deal, then you would, wouldn't care about joining a group or whatever. And I'm taking it for granted that you do want to join a band. And this is much different than sitting in your living room playing, you know, along with the stereo or playing scales. So you're going to have the opportunity later, as I teach you the bass patterns, to uh, play along with this drum machine and this guitar player. So let me go ahead and introduce Angelo Giannotti. You saw him on the opening jam. Angelo has been uh, on all the Super Chops for bass videos, past, present, and probably future and uh, is going to be coming out with some of his own videos called Super Chops for Guitar. Now, also, he, uh, and this is very noteworthy, I think, is has been selected by Mark Varney of Legato Records to appear on an upcoming CD. It's going to be released after the first of the year, hopefully, 94. And uh, it features Alan Holsworth on the cover. I think it's called, uh, uh, what is the name? Edge. Guitar on the Edge, Part 6, or Number 6. And Angelo has been selected to be on there with a number of noted guitar players and up-and-coming guitar players like him. Now, having said all that, let me go through my choice of gear real quick, and then we'll move on with the lesson. Okay, basses. I use carbon four, five, and six-string basses. Here's a six-string fretted, for example, and then the blue one is a five-string fretless. You might see fret markers, but it is, in fact, fretless. Uh, these basses sound great, they play great, they look great, and it's a good value for the, for the money. Now, GHS strings. I use normally boomers or super steels, and uh, usually light gauge or even extra light and sometimes medium, depending on the application and the bass that I'm using. What I recommend to beginners, and you're going to love the way new strings sound, even though these are starting to get kind of dead actually after the jamming we've just done, uh, is light gauge boomers. It's very easy to push down. If you want it sometime to go to a heavier gauge, you can move up to medium or medium light. On the other hand, you can go to extra light if you're a real wimp like me. Uh, okay, let's look at a couple of devices. This is called a hip shot. And a million guys have these, including all my students. And uh, basically, it just lowers the E string 
to a predetermined note, like a D, which is very commonly used. And I'm not going to really go into that too much. It's not fundamental to learning the instrument. So we'll save uh, more demonstration of that and application for an intermediate lesson. Same thing with the Kaler Wangwar, which is just like a guitar player has. I use these on some solo things. I don't think I used it in the opening solo. But uh, one, once again, this is not really fundamental to a, a beginner bass player, but it might be something you want to check into at a later time. Now, let's move on. Tuners. I'm going to show you the reason you need to get a tuner. This is a Sabine tuner, and this is really cool. This is the rack mount unit, and I've decided to use this. This is what is normally in my rack, um, even though this is the one that I recommend for beginners. It's, well, the main reason is because it's a lot more affordable. Although, these two units have the exact same uh, technology, or uh, insides, I guess, which leads me to the question, why does one take up a lot more room? I don't know. But in any event, uh, I'm going to demonstrate this in just a few minutes and show you why and how to use a tuner. And that's the one that I recommend for uh, most beginners. Metronomes. I use Sabine metronomes also. Both these are Sabine. Now, as far as uh, effects, which I use, and once again, this is the kind of thing you might want to look into soon, but it's not rudimentary uh, as far as something you have to have as a beginner. But once again, a lot of my students end up getting this uh, the same unit. It's by ART. It's called the Night Bass. Uh, that's the studio edition, and it's got a billion great sounds in it. Okay, now as far as amplification, obviously, I'm using carbon, and I use a number of different setups depending on the application and the size room. Uh, here, I'm using, this is something relevant to you, and I'm using a carbon combo 150. Now, this bad boy is like a mini brute. That's what I call it. It's like uh, 150 watts RMS, very small, a 10-inch speaker, which is 200 watts, got a state-of-the-art preamp, which I really like. And this thing will fool you. It gets real loud, real clean, and produces a lot of low end uh, without distorting or anything. And it's uh, just a great value. It's like a $300 or something like that. Now, it's also available over here behind the blue base. And uh, the same, it's the same preamp and everything, but it's in a slightly larger case because it's got a 15-inch speaker, which is good for like uh, a little bit more low end. I actually prefer the 10, personally. That, there's about $80 difference, something like that. Okay, on part two, I'm going to show you a cool uh, uh, kind of option that you have with either one of these, and that's that it will push an additional speaker cabinet, you know, so you don't really grow out of it. And let me just say as a, a final note, these things, uh, unlike, I have so many students that come in and they have like a small 40-watt practice amp or something, and uh, it doesn't sound good, and it doesn't sound loud, and it distorts, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is something you're not going to grow out of. So I really recommend this, this to... Uh, Anybody that's uh, interested in that kind of sound quality and not something they're going to grow out of shortly. Okay, having said all that, now let's move on to the next section. Now let's look at how to string the bass. First, you've got to have a bass and a string. Lay the bass flat or somewhere like this or in a bed or a table or what have you. First thing, obviously, you've got to do is secure the string down to the, the bridge. Now, the Kaler has kind of a notch, so you've got to kind of keep a certain amount of tension on it as you pull it down to this end. Now, at some point, you're going to need to cut off probably the, some of the excessive uh, string length. And as you can see, I'm going about three or four fingers or, you know, maybe three inches beyond this tuning post. That's a good rule of thumb. Cut off the rest, dispose of it like that. Now, if your tuner has a, the tuning post has a hole, which it will, either vertical or horizontal, depending on it, Put it in there, then wrap it around. So always start at the, the top of the post and wrap downwards. After you get one or two wraps on there, use this finger to hold it in place, keep it from flying all over the place, and obviously tune the string up. Now, if you don't have perfect pitch, which I'm going to assume you don't, then you need to do one of a couple of things. The first thing you can do is, if you do have a tuner, watch the tuner. But now that I've got it tight, you can see that what I'm going to do is is turn the amp on. Now, this will give you kind of a good demonstration of the tuner, as a matter of fact. Two for one. Okay, this tuner, like I said, is easier to see than the smaller floor mount unit for video purposes, so I'll be demonstrating that. But they both work, have the same controls, and they work identically. So, if you do have a tuner, as you can see what's going on, you have a row of LEDs that's, there's 12, one standing for each note of our tonal system. 
And when you play the note, you will see that A, what note it's, it's closest to, that's showing that uh, this is close to a G. However, the lights up here indicate that I'm sharp. It even says it on there. Now, if, if it were flat, obviously this light would be on. This is the in-tune light. Now, what I'm going to do, you won't see it yet, but I'm stretching the string out a little bit. And as you can see, the, as you get closer, the blinking gets a little bit slower, indicating that you're very close to being in tune. Okay, now the string is in tune with a G, so you can see how the tuner works. There you have that. However, now what you have to do is going back to the bass, you're going to have to stretch the string out. This is mandatory, and it's true with guitars or basses, so don't be alarmed if you tune it up and it seems to go flat several times. This is to uh, go ahead and get that out of the way, so to speak. You can hear that it's gone a little bit flat. You, now, personally, it may look a little bit aggressive or abusive, but it's something that I do, and it's not going to hurt the string or the bass. And get it as close as you can to pitch. Now let's move on to actually tuning the bass, and that will do it for the stringing section. Okay, let's look at tuning the instrument. Uh, first, let's establish that your bass can be in tune with itself, but not tuned up to what's known as standard pitch. This is like an international, worldwide type standard tuning, where A440 means an A note is 440 cycles per second. Don't get too carried away with that uh, technology thing. But now, so let's look at first the good and the bad things about having a tuner. You've got to have a tuner, no matter what, even if you have perfect pitch. The good things are it allows you to tune quickly, precisely, evenly, even without a sound coming out of the amp if you want, uh, with a minimal amount of, of fuss. And especially if you've got four guys tuning at the same time, it uh, could be havoc. So that's uh, the good thing about a tuner, especially in a studio or live. You want to tune up real quick and real precisely. The bad thing, and I've seen this with some beginner students who've even been playing for a year or two, is that they become reliant, or if you will, addicted to the tuner, and they can't even tune their own instrument. And uh, I, I really hate to see that. Of course, there was electricity when I came up, but it was not these, uh, uh, easily to, easy to acquire tuners. So I had to learn by ear, and it's uh, kind of a good thing for ear development. So here, going back to the tuner, specifically the Sabine tuner, is a very cool feature which this, uh, this tuner has, plus it helps your ear development. Now, all I'm going to do is press the function button, and what this, this is going to do is actually produce As soon as I set it on the right function, it's going to produce a given tone. Okay, that's an A. So what I'm going to do is tune, well actually let's go down to G. And that's the good thing about this tuner also, is that it has all the notes in our tonal system. Here's the way I recommend you do this. You hear the tone. Now if you have a piano also, you can do that because pianos are normally tuned to pitch. And get as close as you can first by ear. Once again, this is good for ear development. At that point, you can plug back into the tuner. And I'm going to show you how to do this and use the method which I outlined a little while ago and fine tune it. And as you can see, I'm a little bit flat. And you do that. Now, so once you've established that the G string is in pitch, then let's look at how to tune the D string to the G and then across the neck. The fifth fret, I, I'm just going to use an overhand technique just so you see exactly what's going on on my left hand at this point. The fifth fret of the D should sound the same note, which is a G, as the open G string. Now with the right hand technique, if we can get a close up of the right hand just for one second, I want to point out something. If you play the open G and then the D, you've got both notes ringing, you've got a reference tone. However, if you play it the other, in the other order, you got the D and then the G, then if you're using a rest stroke, which I'm going to demonstrate in a few minutes, then you're going to come back and kill the uh, vibration of the D string. So my, my uh, sequence would be the open string, then the fretted one. So get it as close as you can by ear. Now, if it was a little bit flat, okay, if it sounds like this, I would expect your ear to tell you something is amiss. Although, at first, don't be uh, concerned if you can't tell if it's flat or sharp. So get it as close as you can by ear and then consult the tuner. And once again, I'm checking my G string, then the D. 
-hmm. Now, use the same method across the bass, all the way across, so that using the fifth fret of the A and tune that string to the open D. Then, of course, the, uh, obviously the fifth fret E string, tune that to the A. And there you have the uh, tuning section. And that's the way that goes. Now, make sure that you're not tuning the one string or playing one string and turning the other key, because I see this on a weekly basis. Somebody's playing a G and they're turning the D uh, tuning peg, which uh, is counterproductive. So just make sure that you're always turning the right one and tuning the wrong string to the right string as opposed to the inverse of that, which is totally counterproductive. Okay, now moving on, what we're going to do next is, as I consult my outline, is the anatomy of the bass that is. Now, as we move in this direction, down here, what a cue, we're going to look, obviously this is the headstock. These are the tuning keys. We already covered the tuning post. This is the nut. And your nut is the last thing that the string passes over at the end of the neck. This, obviously, is the neck. This is the fingerboard that you're playing on. Now, down here to the body, self-explanatory. Now, here's your bridge. And no matter what type of bridge configuration you have, you're going to see uh, separate individual string saddles, one for each string. Now, these will move in two different directions, forward and backward. That's for intonation, but don't worry about that right now. But uh, as far as setting the action, which I want to give you just a little brief uh, description of, it will have another uh, screw, or it might be an Allen wrench, or it might be a flathead. It varies with every bridge, actually, to lower or raise the action. Now, if your bass is hard to play, if it feels like the strings are really high, you might want to take the screwdriver and try lowering it just a little bit. Then tune the string back up to pitch and play every fret. Make sure that every fret produces a good, solid note all the way up, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what you want to avoid is that kind of sound. If you're using proper left-hand technique, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, then you should get a nice, solid sound as opposed to that. However, if you're using good technique and you still get, then your string's probably a little bit too low, in which case you can do the opposite, raise it back up. Now, let me just go ahead and interject this, and that's that you definitely need to find uh, a good local guitar rep or uh, a reputable guitar technician or repair guy. And that's for repairs, modifications, or routine maintenance. Uh, find out somebody that you can take your bass to for any of the above. Okay, let's move on. The pickups, nothing more or less than the microphones. Just picks up the sound of the bass, transmits it to the amp, then to the neighbors. Now, tone controls. Let's look at... Uh, uh, a couple of different aspects here. A lot of basses will have a different configuration. If you've got like an old type of bass, like say a precision, and all you have is a volume knob and one tone, I would suggest leave both of them full open, you know, all the way up for the best sound. However, if you have active controls, such as this, okay, let me explain what, that's uh, inoperative at this point. Here's an overall volume, self-explanatory. And it doesn't matter so much that this is all the way up on active electronics. It continues to have a uh, kind of the same sound no matter what volume you have. Okay, he, this is a pan control. And what it does is pan between the rear, the front pickup and the rear pickup all the way at the other side. I happen to like that sound for certain things. But as a place to start, you'll feel a notch right in the middle, and that's the key, which is both pickups on equally. So uh, leave that in the middle, at least to begin with. Same with the uh, bass, bass control. That's the bass boost or cut. That's a lot of bass, that's no bass. You can hear it roll it in. Once again, a good place to start, rule of thumb, no uh, pun intended, is right in the middle. You'll feel a little notch if this is the type of controls that you have. By the way, let me also say that if you have a, 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 an instruction manual, go ahead and read it and just make sure you know what knobs are, you're turning. Same thing with the treble control. That adds treble, and this cuts treble. And as you can see, there's quite a difference. Once again, leave it right in the middle. Personally, I'll boost normally a little bit of each, but if you turn both of them all the way up, you're going to get a certain amount of distortion. So there you have that. Now let's move on to the amplifier and the preamp section. Volume, once again, self-explanatory. Crank it as loud as possible. No, I'm kidding. Okay, the bass control. Now on the carbon preamp, which I really like, there is a bass boost button. I don't know if you can see it from your camera angle or your uh, perspective, but I happen to like the boost that that gives, and so I leave that in on all my preamps. 
the knob, I leave pretty much flat, or for subtle changes, I'll add a little bit or take a little off. Usually in the middle is a good, once again, place to start. Now with the mid-range control, this has, uh, like I said, kind of a state-of-the-art mid-range uh, or preamp section, and consequently the mid-range is sweepable. This is known as a parametric. One of them actually sweeps the frequency in one direction that's low, middle, mid-range, or upper range. And then this knob controls how much is boost, uh, it's boosted or cut. Now moving on to the treble side. You also have a knob as well as a treble switch. And I happen to like the sound, uh, well it kind of varies with the place I'm playing actually. But uh, I usually leave everything kind of flat, maybe a slight boost on the treble knob. Once again it varies. Now let me tell you the way to find out what the knobs and buttons do and what you like. Very simple formula. Turn knobs and push buttons. Simple as that. You know, you can read the uh, owner's manual until you're blue, blue in the face, but what you want to do is actually play and find out what these things do and what you like and dislike, and that's really the key to it. So experiment. Turn knobs, push buttons. Okay, let's move on. Now that we've gone over the anatomy and uh, tone section, I'm going to go to the next section, which will cover neck familiarization, rhythm, and technique. Okay, now let's learn the notes on the neck. First, let's establish there's 12 notes in our tonal system, A through G sharp. The seven natural notes are A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Each one has a sharp and a flat, and as you're going to learn, uh, every note's sharp is equivalent to another note's natural or flat. Uh, don't let that confuse you, because I'll explain it in just a minute. Okay, we're going to learn the seven natural notes, A through G, on the E string, from the open string up to the 12th fret. Okay, let's go ahead and also establish that, for the most part, and if you use this as a formula, it'll always work. The seven notes, the seven naturals, have a whole step between them. Now, on the neck, a whole step is two frets. In other words, like from the fifth to the seventh fret, or in the opposite res direction, that, the name of that interval is a whole step. A half step is one fret, like that. Now, if we establish that most of them do have a whole step or two frets between them, except for two pairs, and that is the E and F, let's call them next door neighbors for simplicity's sake, and B and C. Now, let's look how that formula applies on the E string, and you'll see that it holds true. Okay, starting with the open E, or the zero fret, same thing, E, F, G, A, B, C. Once again, those are right together. D, E. And that's where everything starts over. If you're ambitious, which I hope you are, take that same formula and continue it up as far as you can on your neck. E, F, G, A, B, etc. Now, don't only look at it and uh, recite it forwards, do it backwards. E, D, C, B, a, G, F, E. Same thing holds true for the A string. Let's check it out. Same formula. A, except of course you're starting on an A note. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. A, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. Now, Learn what I've just taught you. Go over it every time you pick up the bass. Call the note, look at the fret. It's uh, a matter of recognition. And repetition is the name of the game. That's how it commits to memory. Now your homework, should you decide to accept it, is learn the same thing on the D and G string. Now I'm gonna let you do that on your own using that same formula of whole steps and half steps uh, with the natural notes. Now let's look at sharps and flats very briefly. If this is an A, fifth fret E string, an A sharp is one fret higher, which is the same as a B flat. There's a B, there's a B flat. So those no or notes are called inharmonic equivalents. Same note, but different names depending on the key signature. Okay, now let's look at an A flat. Always one fret lower than the natural. A natural, A flat. And there you have flats and sharps. Okay, now let's move on to using the metronome or uh, a drum machine. I'm going to use a drum machine uh, today. It'll be easier for you to hear on video. But first, let me show you the metronome that I recommend to my students. And it took me a long time to find one that I actually liked. Uh, this is the Sabine. And first, let me say that, um, let me tell you the reason for using a metronomic device, be it this or a drum machine. You got to, you need to establish uh, your sense of timing. Timing. Well, first, let's look at tempo. 
Tempo, by my definition, is the ability to play something at a given pace or rate over a certain amount of time, like for a minute or two or what have you, without speeding up or slowing down. Timing, I consider to be something a little bit different, actually. And I look at that as being more like precision. For example, say if I wanted to play, and you should be able to hear that, right along with that, that would be good timing, accurate. If I were playing behind the beat or in front of the beat, that would be poor timing. So I, I uh, kind of correlate timing to accuracy. Now, the other reason, there's actually two more reasons. One is to get used to playing with a click. Because even if you have a, sense of, a good sense of timing by yourself, if you're in a studio or when you go to work with a drummer, which you will shortly, then you need to be able to follow somebody, whether it's a click track or a live drummer or a drum machine. The other reason I'm going to reserve for part two because it has to do with technical improvement and that's a little bit more progressive than I want to get at this point. So this metronome, getting back to this, the Sabine, obviously you got an on-off switch. And this one, you probably can't hear it that well, produces a good clear tone for a click. Now to boot, it also has a light in the event you're deaf, which you ought to get out of the business if you are. Um, just kidding. Now the other thing to boot with this is that you have uh, an A440 tone, which is kind of cool, and once again, good for tuning. And you tune your A string to that. In any event, always, always, always play and practice, whether it's licks, songs, uh, patterns, scales, exercise, always play with a metronomic device. Like I said, today I'm going to be using this. Now let's get into time signatures. Common time is known as 4-4. Four, four. Watch it. Okay, first let me explain time signatures. When you see a time signature, if it's C, that means 4-4, four, four, which is the most common time signature, hence the name. Uh, if, uh, for example, that means there's four quarter notes. The top number means how many there are per measure. The bottom shows you which note gets the count. So if it's a, a four on bottom, it's the quarter note. If it's two on bottom, it's a half note, eight, eighth note, 16, blah, 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 et cetera. So 4-4 four, four means there's four quarter notes per measure. Uh, if it, just for hypothetical uh, uh, correlation, if it said 15, 16, then that means there's 15 sixteenth notes. And if you listen to yes, you'll hear that kind of time signature sometimes uh, in a measure or a pattern. So there you have it. So let me show you how to count and get a feel for 4-4. Four, four. What I've got is an open hi-hat on one. And you need to establish this sense of timing. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. When you listen to a song, going down the street or whatever, always try and pick up where one is. And I've seen students that could count one, two, not very good. You, but if you work on it, if you do develop that, then it's, uh, it's mandatory. It's, it's, as much, it's as necessary as knowing if that's in tune or not in tune. So let's look at this. First, I'm going to give you some note values. A whole note is equal to four quarter notes and would be played as follows. Three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, etc. Half notes are half as long. This is pretty logical mathematically. And last for two quarter notes, such as one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Quarter notes are played predictably. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now we're going to get into subdivision. This is where eighth notes, and uh, there are eight eighth notes in a measure of four, four. Two eighth notes per quarter note. They're counted as follows. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and etc. And they're perfectly subdivided halfway between each quarter note. So there you have that. Now, let's look at... Um, one thing about phrasing before we move on, and that is, let me give you these terms also. Staccato means a short note, such as, if I were playing quarter notes and it had a staccato or uh, that type of uh, designation to it, it would be played short notes, as opposed to legato, which is where the notes are held, they're no faster or slower, they're just held for a longer duration. Each, each legato note lasts until the beginning of the next note, such as three, four, 
One, two, three, four. Staccato. Legato. And there you have that. Now keep that in mind, and uh, also when we get to the patterns later, and even some of the exercises which we're getting ready to do, then I'm going to ask for mainly uh, legato playing, and that's real good for your left hand. Okay, now let's look at proper technique. First, the left hand. Keep your fingers always close to the neck. You don't want to be doing uh, this type of scenario when you're fretting notes. That's not only goofy looking, it's, uh, it's a waste of, of movement. Now, when it comes to left hand technique, also you need to think about where your thumb is. Keep it basically behind the second finger. Now, you don't have to super glue it in that, that uh, position or anything, but as a general rule of thumb, pun intended, that's the way it goes. If my neck were invisible, you would see something like this. Now, let's uh, also establish that you need to put it in the middle of the back of the neck. In other words, you don't see it peeping over the top. You don't see this, and I do see beginners do that. That's a no-no. Keep it, for the most part, in the middle, which is about right there, on the back of the neck. Occasionally, you'll see me do something, you know, where that requires that for me to violate that, that rule, but uh, for the most part, leave it right in the middle. Okay, so let's look at left-hand development as far as strength and endurance of each finger. If you have a metronomic device, which I urge you, if you don't have it, put the video on hold, go down to the store and get one. Come back and do this. It's going to last for 16 beats. If you don't, uh, sit yourself in front of a clock or something and hold it for 16 uh, seconds, if you will. And what I want you to do is fret it very close to the middle of the fret, not on the fret wire, pretty much between them, so that you get a good solid note like that. Not and also, if you're not pressing down hard enough, you may get that same effect. What you're going for is a good quality sound. And you're going to play legato. Hold your finger down for the entire 16 beat sequence, such as, and be sure to count. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Hold it down. Pretend you didn't see my thumb peeking over the top there. Okay, then go to the second finger. Hold it down real tight. Now, as you can see, that was for like 16 beats. Your homework, obviously, is to go ahead and do the same thing. I'll save tape time with the third and fourth. Don't neglect those because a lot of beginners and novice players do end up doing that. And these are your weakest and least coordinated fingers normally. So do the same exact thing with the third and fourth fingers and hold it down for the entire duration. Really helps develop the strength, the touch, and the endurance. Okay, now let's up the ante, so to speak. Four notes per string. Call it the four by one. Four fingers, four notes, four frets on one string. Check it out. Two, three, four. When you get up to the pinky, repeat the high note. Always count. Two, three, four. Repeat the low note. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Do it all the way across the neck, which is the next uh, step we're going to take it to. Now, that the 4x4, four four, which is what we're expanding it to, and this is the entirety of the exercise, is going across doing what we just did, then changing strings. Once again, this gets you used to swap, you know, switch, uh, skipping across strings. Okay. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Fingers close to the neck. Repeat the high note. Okay, for time's sake, obviously I've only done it once. You need to do that exercise at least a minute. At least a minute, just non-stop and stay right with the click. Now, let's move to the right hand and look at proper technique. Um, let's establish several things. You have to anchor your thumb somewhere. This is a no-no, this is a no-no, that's a no-no. My suggestion is the pickup. It's for stability and uh, also as a rest, uh, use as a backstop in the rest stroke, which I'm showing you right now. Let me angle this a little bit. When you're playing on the E string, for example, just for now, I'm going to, with the left hand, don't even think about looking at it yet. Just, you can do it with the open string, but just so we get some left hand use while we're uh, doing a right hand exercise, fret the fifth note, which is an A note. So it should sound like that. Get used to doing your up stroke like that, not up like that. And I see people do it all the time. You want to use a rest stroke across the E to the, onto the thumb. Okay, when you move over to the A, 
it comes to rest against the A, or the E string rather. Two reasons. One, it keeps you from moving just you know, all over the place, acts as a backstop. More importantly, it also keeps the E string from ringing unwantedly. Now, here's the floating thumb theory. Whoa, there it goes. Okay, when you go down to the D string to play, your thumb should float from the pickup down to the E string. Please do this because otherwise you're going to be haunted by noise like that, which is definitely unnecessary and unsatisfactory. So you can see I'm playing the D string, coming to rest against the A, the thumb is covering the E. When I move down, float the thumb again. G string, coming to rest against the D. The thumb, when it's on the A, it inadvertently is also killing the E string. So that's the floating thumb deal. Let me show you an exercise. Just hold it right where you are. And this is the exercise. I'm going to slow this down a little bit. To get used to A, rest strokes, and B, floating the thumb. Four notes per string, fifth fret on the left hand. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Float the thumb. Two, three, four. Float. Two, three. Repeat the high note. Float. Float. Okay, do that for at least one full minute. Then take the second finger, same thing, real quickly. Two, three, count. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, float the thumb. Float. Repeat. Float. Okay, once again, keep, um, keep in mind at least one minute per finger. This also helps develop the strength and the uh, endurance and precision, which I wasn't exercising very well because I was trying to talk and look at notes and everything else while I was playing. However, always count and make sure you're right with the click. That's an absolute. Now, let's look at one more thing with the right hand. There's a close-up, um, and that's getting used to alternating the two fingers. And it should sound like this. Don't worry about the speed. Worry about making the notes sound the same. What you don't want is unevenness, timing-wise, like you don't want that. You want real even, right with the click, and you want them to sound the same, as opposed to you don't want that. You don't want certain notes to sound accented or pronounced. You want them to sound the same. Some people would even say try and make each finger sound like the other one, if that makes sense. Go ahead and uh, use that. Do it on each string. And that's going to help both your technique and your sense of timing. Okay, now let's look at putting both these exercises together. Um, okay, so we're going to do the 4x4 four four with the left hand. I don't know if you're going to be able to do a close-up of both hands, but ultimately here's what you're going for. Proper fretting technique with the left hand, long notes across the board, and always alternating the fingers of the right hand in this exercise. Now. There will be some licks or patterns where it's not necessary to uh, alternate the two fingers. So there's some violation to this rule. It's not like an absolute all the time. But this exercise, yeah, it's absolutely, uh, uh, it's not imperative, but it's, it's uh, productive if you go ahead and alternate. So let's look at the 4x4 four four using proper technique all over the place, left hand, right hand. And that tempo is probably OK for you guys. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Float the thumb. Alternate fingers. Float. Getting a little bit of fingernail in there. Float the thumb. Once again, the things to concentrate on or evenness. You heard a little bit of fingernail in there on my second finger. Um, evenness of tone with the right hand, staying with the click, using the proper left hand technique, legato notes, and always alternating the right hand fingers, using upstrokes, using uh, rest strokes, and floating thumb. I mean, am I asking too much? 
uh, in any event. And that's the way that goes. Now let's look at, let's go on and uh, I'm going to give you some scales, and patterns, and some practice routines, and that's coming up right after this. Now let's look at the major and minor scales. First, I want to show you the construction. And to do so, I'm going to show you the intervallic uh, sequence on one string. It's easier to see that way. Then I'll show you the more uh, logical position to be playing that in. A major scale, no matter what, what key it's in, always goes like this. Root note, whole step. And let me show you on the neck here. Root, whole step, whole step, half, whole, 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 half. The more you do this and go back down to, I want you to get used to hearing the tones. And it's good to memorize that. Whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Now let's look at a, fi a proper fingering for the, uh, this is a pretty standard fingering for the major scale. So if you look at my left hand, you'll see exactly what fingers and frets I'm using. Here it is one time through. When you get to the top note, once you're doing it with a metronome, repeat the high note and the low note just to keep it in 4-4. Four, four. I want you to check it out. And also we're going to be using different combinations of the left hand fingers. So if you'd like, just on each string, just as a little miniature exercise, you might use this. As you can see, 5th and 7th fret, 2nd and 4th finger. You're going to have a tendency to want to use that. Don't, trust me. So you might just go back and forth, getting used to that fingering. Over on the A string, we're using frets 4, 5, and 7, using fingers 1, 2, and 4. Skip a finger, skip, skip a fret, here we go. You go back and forth. Okay, now on the D string, you're uh, changing slightly, and you're probably going to confuse this. Most people do at first, these two strings. You're using frets 4, 6, and 7, fingers 1, 3, and 4. So you're changing the, uh, the finger and fret that you're skipping. Here we go. Go back and forth, just as an exercise. Now, when you glue these things together, what you have is... Now, let's talk about intervals. Keep looking at the left hand, and I'm going to point this out to you. Like I said earlier, an interval is just the name given to uh, identify the length, or rather the distance, between two notes. And not, uh, not by chance, there are seven notes in a major scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The eighth note is just the octave, so it's not a different note. It is a different pitch. That's an A. That's an A one octave higher. Now, the name that it, or the number in which it appears, uh, boy, this is convenient, happens to be the name they've given the interval. For example, a major third is the third note from a major scale. One, two, three. Let me see if I can get a little bit better camera angle here. One, two, whoa, three. The major second is the second note from a major scale. Okay, the fourth is uh, like this, one, two, three, four. Now you're going to get used, more and more used to hearing the intervals the more you play them and also, you know, seeing them on the neck. A fifth, one, two, three, four, five. Obviously the f known as a perfect fifth, perfect fourth. Those do not have major and minor uh, uh, designations. Now the sixth, one, two, three, four, five, six, is there, and this is the major seventh. Once again, very, very logical and very mathematical. Okay, now let's look at the minor scale. First, I'm going to go over the construction. Once again, just doing it in a very linear manner on the E string. Check it out. Root, whole step, half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole. Going in reverse. Okay, the thing to remember um, is that when you take that sequence of intervals, it doesn't matter where you start, it's always a minor scale. With the major scale, for instance, whenever you use that same shape, say you move up uh, to a G note, just as an arbitrary place. Back to the major scale. It's always a major scale when you use that fingering, 
What dictates what major scale is the note you start on. Consequently, that's a G major, D major, etc. Now, let's look at the minor scale, a left hand fingering that I suggest for that scale. And here we have. You can pretty much see exactly what I'm doing. But in the event you can't, using fingers 1, 3, and 4 on frets 5, 7, and 8. Same thing on the A string, the last two notes. Now let's look at the differences in the major and minor scale. There's only three notes that are different. The third is different. We have a C there as opposed to a C sharp, which is the major third. So that's a minor third. Root, second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh. And if you look at it, the minor seventh, like all minor intervals, is one fret lower than its major counterpart. And of course, the octave is always the same. In the same way, if you move this shape around, say starting on an E, you've got an E minor scale. And there you have that. Now let's go on and uh, do some patterns along with the drum machine and Angelo. Now here's the patterns. The way I'm going to do it is this. Angelo and I and the drum machine, three piece, are going to go through the pattern like one time through the whole chord progression. In this uh, first example, it's going to be a C major uh, one, four, five progression. That'll make more sense to you as we go along and as you progress musically. Uh, the chord's going to be C major, F major, and G major. Now keep that in mind because uh, it'll make more sense later. And uh, what this is, it's kind of a, an old shuffle type feel and probably during your career you'll, you'll play this progression and maybe this feel a number of times. In any event, the method I'm going to use for all these play-alongs, as we'll call them, is you'll listen to us do it, once again, three piece, one time through the chord progression. After that, I'll show you note for note exactly what the fingering and the phrasing and everything is. You learn it, memorize it. Then when we come back, we'll do a longer version where I play through it the first time and you match me note for note. After that, the second and third time, I'm going to have my volume off and you're going to be playing along uh, with the drums and Angelo. Now on the second one, what I might do is just turn my volume down so you don't hear any bass, but I might go ahead and finger it just so that if you are playing along, this will give you like video, visual reinforcement, if you will. The third time, I might even go and get a hamburger or something. And uh, so the ball will be in your court, so to speak, and I want you to watch Angelo on the third time through. And go ahead and, if you can, get a feel for what the guitar chord looks like, you know, or the position of the neck as you're playing through the, the pattern. But your ear ought to tell you if you're in the right place or not. In any event, uh, here's the pattern. My career is right now. If Mark Varney or Mike could see me now. Okay, here's the pattern, note for note. First, keep in mind we're operating out of C major, and with the exception of one note, it'll be out of C major scale. So if you want to think about that shape on the neck, once again. Here's the notes. Let's take them four at a time. You're starting on the eighth fret. Start on the second finger of your left hand, eighth fret E string, which is, as you should by no, know by now, is a C major, or C natural. Now here's the pattern. That's the first four. The next four. Okay, that's the entirety of that one pattern. We play that twice, and Angelo is on a C chord at that point. So we're going one, two, three, four. Repeat the pattern. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now be aware that that's the last note of the pattern, not the C. You don't return to that unless you're repeating the pattern. Now, let's con uh, for, uh, so we're talking apples and apples. Let's consider that the first position of this pattern. At that point, move over to the second position, which is where we're doing the same exact thing, except over on the A string, same shape. So let's look at it like this. And 
the tablature and the notation will point it, will further verify what notes I'm playing. Then you do that once in the second position, move back to the first position and play through it once, such as. Then we're going to move up to what we'll call the third position of this entire sequence. And Angelo is now playing a G chord, just for your sake of knowing the uh, correlation between the pattern and the chord. G major, and here's the four note walk up. Slide down, that was the 10th fret, slide down to the 8th fret, back in the second position, four note walk up, same shape. And then back to position one for a, you might call it a, a four note walk up to this. Then we're going to end on the G for four notes. And that's the entirety of the entire pattern, the completion of it. Now, let me say this about that. Uh, keep in mind that you need to play legato, in other words, long notes, not go ahead and where each note lasts until the beginning of the next note. Twice there, once there. We already covered the uh, positions. So now I'm going to do it this way, like I outlined a minute ago. We'll play through the entire chord progression three full times. The first time you'll hear the bass. The second and third times you will not hear the bass and they'll be panning back and forth probably between my fingering on the second time through and Angelo's guitar chord work. On the third time it'll be all Angelo and you're going to be playing the bass. So now let's look at the longer version. Here we go. Legato notes. Now it's all your own. Okay, now let's go to pattern number two. Whereas we were in C major and playing straight quarter notes on the first pattern that we just completed, now we're going to go to an even harder type thing. And uh, we're going to be playing eighth notes. Now the tempo is not going to be tremendously fast or anything, but this is going to be more of a rock feel, and it's going to be out of the key of A minor. Now Ange is not going to play such pretty chords. This will be a little bit more crunched out, a little bit more distortion. And all the notes, this is known uh, a lot of times people will refer to this as pumping eighth notes where it's a simple pattern in that there's not as much movement as there one was in the beginning. We're playing right off the root notes of the power chords that Angelo is going to be playing. Now if you're a rocker, this is super important that you keep the tempo and the feel, even as simple as it is, you're supporting along with the drums that driving eighth note type of uh, progression. So um, let's uh, go on and do it in just a second. Let me just point out that please pay attention to my left hand fingering. A lot of people, once again, based on years of experience will want to favor certain fingers and what I want you to do is pay attention when I go through the note-by-note uh, -note explanation of this pattern to the exact fingering I'm using and uh, with that let's go ahead and do the pattern
Okay, now all the notes out of this pattern come from the A minor scale. And uh, you can see that. I'll point that out as we go. However, we start on the A. I'm going to break this down to four segments for this entire chord progression. The first one, and you're pumping eighth notes throughout the entire pattern until uh, just part of the end. Actually, all the way through the end. The first one is eight notes to be played on the A note, then four on the C and four on the D. That's going to sound like this. And I'll go ahead and count it as eighth notes. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. That's the first quarter. The second quarter is eight on the A note, four on the G, slide over, four on the C, four on the B. So here we go. One and two and three and four and one and two and one and two and. And once again, pay attention to the fingers. Okay, the third section is a repeat of the first. Just to be real thorough, I'll go ahead and go through that again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One and two and one and two and. Okay, and then finally, the fourth quarter of this pattern is simply eight on the A, four on the F, four on the G. Once again, pay attention to the left hand fingers that I'm using. And that's going to sound as follows. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Okay, pay attention to this too. You may have detected a different sound that I was getting. Whereas in the shuffle pattern, I was attacking with the right hand a much uh, lighter touch, so to speak. Whereas in the second pattern that we just did, what I'm doing is using a little bit more attack on the right hand, a little bit more movement. If you look at my right hand, you'll be able to see. And that's so I can get a little bit more of that fret growl that actually is part of my sound and many bass players sound for that matter that's used more in heavy metal where you might use, uh, some people use a pick. I just uh, change my attack for, to, for the uh, changing of the sound. So that's something you might want to at least uh, keep as a footnote for further reference later on. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and do the long version as follows. Okay, now, that's going to end the pattern section. I have one more segment I want to go through, and that's going to wrap it up. Uh, and this is very, very vital. I want to talk to you about practice habits. One, let's establish you've got to practice. Uh, that's a given. The more you practice, the better you're going to get, to a degree. Now, the old uh, cliche, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it, and that definitely holds true also. Second, you've got to practice consistently. For example, 30 minutes a day or 60 minutes a day every day is far better than a Monday for 60 minutes, 10 minutes on Tuesday, 30 minutes Wednesday, scattered Thursday, none on Friday, 10 hours on Saturday, etc. So you need to try and set up a certain regiment or routine that you actually stick to. Another thing is uh, staying focused. Maybe go in your room, take the phone off the hook, have somebody screen your calls, and really concentrate on what you're doing. Now the third thing I want to address is this. When you go to practice, please don't make the uh, mistake, which many people do, of just practicing the favorite you know, licks or the most fun parts. Everything that we've covered today, I consider to be very important and vital to your development. And I can guarantee that, and I guarantee that if you overlook some of it, 
uh, you'll later look back and say, gosh, I wish I'd spent more time on neck familiarization or this or that. So as a suggestion, let me just uh, uh, give a possible outline for your practice routine. When you pick up the bass, tune it. That's going to be good for your ear development. Now, as a footnote, let me tell you what I used to do, and this is way before tuners were around, or at least before I had one. I would, at the end of every practice segment, or whenever I was jamming or whatever, I would detune each string, just a little bit flat or sharp. This would force me, for when I pick the bass back up, to tune it, which is real good for ear development. Repetition, once again, is the name of the game. The more you do it, the better you get. So, you might start out by tuning the bass and double-checking it. Okay, the next thing you might want to do is definitely, whenever you pick up the bass, go through the, the uh, neck familiarization exercise or method that I showed you earlier on in the video. Go through it frontwards and backwards, like I said before, call the notes, look at the locations. Next, you might go to the technique exercises. These also serve as a real good warm-up, all the way from the single finger things, all the way up through the 4 by 4 the right hand. Oh, the other thing, always practice with a click. If you haven't gotten a metronome by now, once again, as soon as the video is finished, go get one. And better yet, at some later point, get a drum machine, which is even cooler. Now, next you might go through the scales. Memorize those scales. The more you do it, the more your ear gets in tune with the intervals and hearing it. And the better you get at visualization as far as seeing the intervals, major, minor, perfect, and or the scales. Do them in a lot of different positions, so you really get to know that uh, tonality of that scale. And last but not least, certainly go through licks or patterns, uh, just like the ones we just did, and or any other things that you've learned, such as licks, uh, other scales, modes, exercises. There's a, a glut of information out there, you know, everything from Bass Player Magazine. You have exercises and uh, lessons in the back columns. So try and be a sponge. Learn as much as you can about this instrument, and it's going to pay off in big-time dividends. Okay, having said that, that is going to wrap up the video. On part two, I'm going to... Uh, do kind of a continuation or an expansion, if you will, at an advanced level of all the topics we covered here on part one, uh, plus a bunch of new things, which I'll go into on that. Now, um, having said that, that's going to wrap it up. Once again, I'm Beaver Felton for Super Chops for Bass. Practice hard, don't do drugs, good luck, and I'll see you on part two.